this trip um, to the, the colleagues that I get to spend uh, quality time with, uh, with here and, and to, to, to meet all of you. And so it's just really fantastic to be back again. And um, so, uh, and, and the other, so one of the things I want to point out is I've been, I have a new hobby, and that's uh, collecting um, uh, uh, affiliations. And so, um, so I'm now a professor, and I have been in cell molecular biology for a long time, but now I also have an appointment in biomedical engineering, which is uh, consistent with some things I'm doing. But my favorite is the ob um, uh affiliation. And um, I, I, I've been doing a lot of women's health type research um, uh, related to sexual transmission. I came home and I was telling my wife I'm learning all these things, and she basically yelled at me and says, I'm not going to listen to you and any of this stuff. And then last fall, in September, I got this letter from Northwestern. I opened it up, and it was the um, sort of uh, made it very clear I wasn't getting a raise or anything, but my official appointment in ob -Gyne. So I, I handed it to my wife, and she looked at it, and she's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll take it seriously. So, so, so that was sort of fun. So um, I'll, I'll try to jump right into it here. So um, one of the things we're really interested in, uh, and, and this kind of fits very nicely with um, uh, going after Rafiq, and I know that Ashley talked about this this morning, but it's this idea of looking at the earliest points, uh, times of infection. And so to uh, um, uh, begin to do that, um, <clears throat> and sort of a little bit out of desperation uh, of how to find these very early events, we developed a reporter system um, to find these cells that's a little bit like a needle in a haystack. So, so the idea is you have luciferase in this, so you, you basically package this into SIV. It expresses luciferase, which sort of tells you where the needle is in the haystack, so you can reach in and grab a handful and still be sure that, that you have the light, the light being produced there, the photons. And then the, the cherry fluorescent protein um, is expressed in the, in the individual cells that you can see in the tissue, and we can use that to find the, the specific cells. So, um, so we, um, we worked out conditions in, in, with nude mice where we, we would infect uh, PBMCs with this vector and inject it into the mice and put it into the IVIS and, and look for photons. And we felt pretty good that we could detect about 10, uh, 10 cells or so in close proximity. The, the, the vendor says you can see as few as three together. Um, and, then, uh, and then we can do spectral imaging and other things to find the, uh, the cherry fluorescent protein. So, um, uh, so it it's sort of was a new way to begin to look at um, transmission these are transductions, um, not really infections. There's no viral proteins being made after infection. Um, the first studies we did used high titer JRFL pseudotyped uh, stocks. We chose JRFL for primarily one reason, it worked the best and we felt we needed to have um, um, a best signal as possible in order to move this forward. Um, we did simultaneous vaginal and rectal challenges. We, we did a biopsy. Uh, to let the virus sort of get through somewhere to give us a, uh, like a positive control. And then 48 hours post-exposure at Tulane, um, they, they packaged up the, they did necropsy, packaged up the tissue, send it to us. And then, um, and then the thing we, that's just really great about it, but we didn't really appreciate at the beginning, is it allows us to sort of look at the entire uh, piece of tissue, the entire reproductive tract at the start. So, um, so this is, um, the, this, the first few slides here, this came out um, last fall in PLOS Pathogens. So this just shows an example of what we do. So we get the, the tissue. This is half of the, half of the female reproductive tract. Uh, there's an obvious biopsy site here. We, we soak it in luciferin. We inject it with luciferin. We don't have the sort of circulation of a mouse to pump it around. And so you can see in this case, the biopsy was a real hot spot. Um, interestingly, the biopsies aren't always hot spots. Um, but we're sort of um, as much or more interested in sort of the, the natural, uh, uh, you know, looking at what's going on in areas that we're not manipulating. And so there was a few photons coming out of here. We cut it up, and then we found two pieces that, that had um, uh, made photons. And then we get it down to a two by two millimeter piece of tissue uh, that we want to look for the cells. So it's, it's a very different game looking for these cherry expressing cells in a tiny piece of tissue instead of the whole uh, reproductive tract. So, um, so this is just some examples of, of this is a cherry expressing cell. We can do uh, spectral imaging on this to be sure it has the right characteristics. So that was one, one marker. We know we found the right cell. Then um, we can stain for luciferase expression, right? If you remember, they were both in there. So the, they're, they're luciferase positive, and they have the right, um, right spectrum. And then we can start to ask questions about well, which cells are actually getting uh, infected. So, um, 
And here's some, um, in this first study, we found CD4 cells being infected. We also found um, macrophages, CD4 T cells being infected. We also found macrophages that, that had cherry signal. Um, but very often, the, the cherry signal was, was different, right? It, was, it wasn't completely throughout the cell. It would be sort of discrete. And, and I think at least in some of these, it's, it's it, what uh, Jason Brenchley started talking about last year, which is these, and I'm going to show you, um, talk about this some more today, but this, it's just as likely that this is a macrophage that actually ate a T cell that was expressing the vector. And, and this is going to be a little bit difficult to, uh, to tease apart. So um, one of the big surprises that, that came out of this um, was that we can find, actually not just find, the, the ovary is a hot spot. So this is maybe a little consistent with, I think, what um, Rafiq said, which is the virus can get a long way. It, 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 can, it can move far. It can get there quickly. I don't really want to talk about that um, that much today, but, but essentially um, we can find these uh, cherry positive um, CD3, CD4 T cells in, in the ovary. And um, in a second, I'll show you real infection with SIV there. And I know that a few other labs have also um, been able to show that you can get infection in the ovary at very early time points. We also, the other sort of surprise was that we could find at 48 hours post-exposure uh, cells that were expressing cherry and, and we could detect luciferase in draining lymph nodes. So the, so the virus is already able to get that far. Either, so either the virus got that far uh, in 48 hours it infected a cell that could migrate to the lymph node. They, they move around pretty fast. Or it could be evidence for the uh, famous dendritic cell Trojan horse kind of a model. So, um, and then um, I think, you know, there's a, a lot of students here, and, and I, I, part of it is I'm getting old, but I'm really starting to um, uh, appreciate the, um, uh, the, the, the feedback of my, uh, my colleagues, and, um, and there's other names for some of them, and, um, and also the feedback you get from the review process. So we submitted this paper and, and had this new way of looking at things, and they said, well, we want you to confirm this by doing PCR, which is the way that people have been following these things forever. So we said, fine, we did the PCR. And, um, and so the, but, but the PCR actually, this, this turned out to be really a, um, a, a fantastic thing because we can survey a lot more tissue, we can ask other questions. And so, um, so, so now the PCRing of these animals, tissues from these animals, is now a routine uh, part of what we're doing. And again, what I'm going to uh, go into in a second here shows it becomes very important. This is the um, from the first group of eight animals. Um, this is the luciferase signal. So the the two places where we saw the most in infection were in the um, vaginal vault and the uh, ectocervix. The ovary was the second hot spot. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we could really only see clusters of, of infection, and, and, uh, and so we really didn't detect many of those in the endocervix. And then we, we really prefer to confirm then by finding cells, but sometimes the tissue is so fluorescent, we can't, we can't with great confidence identify uh, the specific cells. And, and really, in the end, um, about 70% of the cells we were seeing transduced by this vector with JRFL uh, pseudotyped envelope were, were CD4 T cells. And then, um, and then the, the, about half of what was left, um, the other 15% was, was seemed to be uh, macrophages, although again, there's this caveat of it could be a macrophage that ate a T cell. And then uh, finally, the, the rest are sort of a mix of dendritic and, and other cell types. So, so the conclusions of this part are uh, a single round dual reporter um, uh, SIV-based vector uh, reporter system uh, can reach all parts of the FRT and draining lymph nodes um, within 48 hours of exposure. 70% of the cells infected with this envelope are CD4 T cells, and then, uh, and then infection can be found in the ovary, which is a bit mysterious because that's a long way for the virus to diffuse, and I, I'm not going to go into this, but we think cilia in the upper reproductive tract are, are having an impact there. So um, uh, one of the other places that were, is of great interest to, to look in this way would be rectal transmission, and I think part of the... Um, uh, one of the lessons that's really been driven home is this idea of, of, of focal infection and needing to see uh, multiple cells together to pick up the photon. So, so, as, so the female reproductive tract, we see these, these foci. In the, in the rectum, we really don't see them very often, very rarely once in a while. It's sort of frustrating. But if we do PCR, we can detect the, the fact that the, the, the virus has integrated into some cells. So our system can't detect those, uh, those events, but we can cheat a little bit. 
and we can do biopsies. So the biopsies then become a place that would allow focal infection that's, that's in the context of the animal. And you know, most of the rectal challenges that people do are atraumatic. I think real rectal transmission is not atraumatic. And, um, but we can go to these biopsy sites and we can uh, get luciferase activity there. And um, the other challenge is, um, you know, you can only just sort of use your imagination, but, but there's all kinds of things uh, in that compartment and many of them are autofluorescent. So we struggled with that, but we finally switched to a, um, a different fluorescent protein that's more in the near infrared range. It's called um, uh, 670, IRFP 670, and we can start to detect that. So, um, so, so we, can, we can find these pieces and then go in, uh, in and we can, we can now find transduced um, cells in the, in the rectal compartment. So, um, so here's an example of that. So this is uh, IRFP670 positive cell. It is luciferase positive. And so, so this, this cell has been transduced. Um, and um, we, can, we can find uh, lots of these. And some, so they're uh, CD4 uh, positive, as you would expect. And, um, and then some of them are uh, CD3 positive. We're just getting going with the phenotyping of this. Uh, we, we have some more, um, some more work to do. Some of them are clearly CD3 negative also. So we're going to have, um, we're going we're gonna to tease this apart and this is, uh, this is ongoing. But, um, and, then, and, and I, th I thought this was kind of a nice starting point, but, but got some really um, important feedback, which is this isn't real infection. And some of the things we heard Rafiq talk about, the, the innate responses, uh, the consequences of viral protein expression, all that, we really couldn't capture uh, that at all. So, um, so sort of with the knowledge that we could, we could take advantage of PCR to ask questions about real virus, um, we, we did um, uh, this sort of, I think, simple experiment. So we took our reporter and we took uh, SIV MAC 239, um, 400,000 TCID 50, mixed them together and then uh, challenged, challenged the animals. And, um, and the reporter tells us where real infection is happening. So now, 48 hours post-inoculation, we can find these foci of infection. And I am just so excited about this, I have to admit. So, um, so, this is an, this is, so we started just by doing, by doing PCR for the SIV MAC 239 and, and the Lich Reporter. The first thing is, I thought, you know, I've been working on these reporters for decades now, and, um, and I thought we were using a lot of reporter here. In terms of the potential to infect a cell, uh, uh, our reporter doesn't even begin to get close to these viral stocks. And then the more I learned about these viral stocks, you know, um, we got some from the, the, the repository that were like 3 million TCID50s per mil. As a, so this, this is you know, a, a good stock, but it's not uh, so incredible. And that's sort of shown here. So if we look at places where we where we pick up um, uh, a PC, PCR, we pick up our reporter, we always find uh, SIV MAC239 uh, cells there. But when we look at other parts of the tissue, we find evidence of the, the SIV infection, but really very little or no um, evidence of the reporter working there. So, but, but we can use the reporter to find these, these sites. So now um, we, we have a bit of a problem, which is, we have to go and, in and find these cells and, um, that are infected and we, we basically need to use antibodies to viral proteins uh, because we don't want to manipulate the virus. So we started by taking uh, macaque PBMCs and, um, and infecting them with, um, with reporter and then characterizing and identifying the best antibodies to allow us to, um, to see uh, gag and envelope in these cells. And then uh, we also got a sense of what um, what these, um, these look like. And so um, what we basically see is gag is sort of uh, spread out throughout the cell. Um, envelope is, uh, is, of course, associated with membranes inside of the cell. So is there any way we could turn the lights down a little bit? Um, but uh, um, so, so, so there's a fairly uh, diagnostic pattern here. You do see some what might be viruses where there's, there's envelope and, and gag overlapping. But we, we got a pretty good idea of what, what we were looking for. So then we started to look in the tissue for, to find uh, infected cells. And, um, and so here's an example of what we, um, what we believe is an infected cell. 
um, and it is positive for envelope and, and gag, and it doesn't, um, uh, it, it hasn't been infected by our reporter that was mixed in there. And um, this is just, this is that cell, um, which actually was found in the ovary. And we're going to rotate this around, and you can see it uh, has a nucleus, nucleus associated with it. It has the sort of look of being a, a small uh, a lymphocyte. And um, uh, so, so this is the way that we, um, we, we identify these cells. And so, um, and, and we really um, wanted to look at these in more detail to, to be very confident they were infected cells. And so there's some um, biology associated with infection that, um, uh, that you heard about this morning. And so um, uh, proteins like NEF made by these viruses, also interactions um, with the, the, um, the envelope protein, et cetera, will, will cause downregulation of internalization, downregulation, degradation of CD4. So if we look at these two cells where we have GAG and EMF, we can see the CD4 here is, is, is much less than CD4 in, in adjacent cells and very often internalized within some sort of, uh, some sort of a compartment. So um, uh, this is exactly what you would expect to see um, in an uh, SIV MAC239 uh, infected cell. And um, here's just a uh, beautiful, thank you, Esper. Um, uh, you guys will like it better now. Um, uh, this is just another, another example, and we, so we see this change in CD4. Another, um, HIV doesn't do this, and, and nobody really understands why, but SIV also causes uh, internalization, but not degradation of CD3. So we can also, um, we can also see that. So, so CD3 would normally be more on the surface of these cells. We see CD3 in this cell, but it, it tends to be uh, more internalized. So, so to be completely honest, um, I was sort of skeptical. I was really worried about... Um, you know, being confident that these were real infected cells. These are just uh, challenging experiments. But, but after the CD3 internalization, I, I was all in. So, um, uh, so now the question is, what kind of cells are these? Phenotyping these cells by immunofluorescence is, um, is very difficult. You don't get to have all the nice um, high, low expression things you get with flow cytometry. We can't, you know, look at 10,000 cells uh, very quickly. And um, uh, we're sort of dependent on, on good antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but we started to, to look at the, these cells. And um, one of the things we've noticed is that, um, and, and I'll give you the quantification, is that um, a lot of these cells have CCR6. So CCR6 uh, indicates there are TH17 cells. And, um, and there's a variety of ways to sort of tease those out. But we've settled upon being CD3 positive, CCR6 positive. And just uh, here's some, a couple of examples of that. And I'll go right to the quantification of where we are now. And we, we need to do this in a, in a better way. But um, the preferred target of SIV MAC239 in these experiments are TH17 cells. And um, uh, you can look at these pie charts. And this was doing it different ways. First, we did CCR6 positive, CCR10 negative. Um, now we're using the CD3 uh, plus, CCR6 uh, plus. Um, and, and really, there is a big preference for these cells. And um, I mean, I think it's a bit of a surprise, although maybe it's not. Well, I think the surprise, and Danny's, Danny's like uh, shaking his head a little bit, but, but I think people think about the gut, there being a lot of these TH17 cells there. But, but and, and this is ongoing, but about 10% of the cells, the T cells in the female reproductive tract are uh, TH17 cells by these markers yet we're getting this big uh, preference for it. So it seems like the, the preference for infecting these cells is, is very high. And, um, and there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things, things to do. But, um, and, and, and I think that my favorite part of all this is <clears throat> you, you do these experiments and you think about these things and you see the cartoons people draw and you try to get a sense of what's, what's going on. And, um, and 48 hours post-inoculation, just the amount of different things that are happening in the tissue are, are I, I just find it to be remarkable. Um, first of all, there's a lot more infected cells than um, I was expecting to see, even with the high titer virus. Um, and so uh, this just illustrates some of the different things we see. So this is, this is just a uh, kind of a, a T cell that's infected with the virus, just looks like a T cell. 
we find lots of these, these fragments, and, and we're, we're characterizing them, but, but it really looks like a lot of the infected cells are, have died by apoptosis. So um, um, we're having some success with an XN5 to, to, to demonstrate that. Um, there are, and it's interesting, there are a few um, uh, movies out there done with multi-photon where you can see uh, an apoptosing cells in tissue and they tend to sort of like break into pieces. The, the, we, we know all the things that happen there. We see uh, a lot of these sorts of events that we're pretty confident is a, um, a, a T cell that was eaten by a macrophage or a dendritic cell. And then we see these sorts of things, um, which it just looks like the, the cell exploded. Um, and um, I, I don't have the movies for you, but when we rotate this in, in three dimensions, it's interesting because the debris from the cell is sort of spread out between the adjacent cells. So it really uh, does look like a lice cell. This could also be related to apoptosis, but, but 48 hours post-exposure, we just, it, it looks like, it looks like a, a battlefield. So we see infected cells, we see remnants of infected cells. Um, there's just a lot going on. And I think what we're seeing here is the, um, um, is the bottleneck, or, or at least one aspect of it, uh, that all this activity can be happening within the first two days of, of a vaginal exposure. So, so this is, I think, um, uh, we can now find these small sites uh, in a fairly straightforward way. We can, I think, ask questions about innate responses, uh, other sorts of things at this site, which cells are being infected, what are the interferon responses, even, even questions relating to um, uh, the, 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 the reservoirs, because the reservoir is supposed to, is supposed to be uh, being set up as early as two or three days post-infection, and so those sorts of events have to be happening at these foci. So I think this has all um, come together in the last six months or so. Uh, we're, we're really um, uh, very excited about it. So I want to shift gears um, quite a bit and, uh, and talk about some of our work uh, that's been um, uh, trying to think about, so, so this is, you know, this is the grail. The broadly neutralizing antibody is going to touch the virus and kill it. And um, if we could just figure out a way to make this from a vaccine, we would all be working on something else. Uh, but we can't uh, figure that, we haven't figured that out yet. So, um, but there are other things that antibodies do. Um, the, one of the things I'll, I'll talk about in a bit is, is related to mucus. But we also had seen for a long time the, the idea that there were antibodies in the epithelial uh, surface here. And so, um, uh, and, and I think we're starting to get a sense of, of what those are all about. So, so really, um, this part of the talk is adventures with labeled antibodies. And I, I, I don't have the time to go into the history of this, but, but like many of the things we do, they've actually, we've actually been working on this and optimizing it over the last, uh, it takes five, six years or longer sometimes. Uh, we had labeled antibodies and, and applied them vaginally and worked with uh, Dennis Burton. I, Ashley was part of some of that early stuff. And, um, and then uh, Vefa uh, Franchini wanted to get a sense of, uh, of when she was putting antibodies uh, into, the, into the, the macaque that she was taking from uh, animals that seemed to be resistant to being infected. She wanted to have an idea of what those antibodies were doing. So, so we... Um, we started to try to see if we could take labeled antibodies and see what happens if we introduce them systemically. And, and there's a bunch of reasons not to try this, right? The, the, the antibody's not going to work the same. The label's going to fall off. There's just, there were, there's a million reasons not to do this experiment. And I'm glad that everyone believed those million reasons. So, um, so it's just amazing. So you take the blood from these animals two weeks, three weeks after you injected them, and you, and you hold them up. And can you guess which one uh, got injected with the, the labeled antibody? It just... It's, uh, it's pretty striking, and I'm not going to necessarily go into it all, but, but the, 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 the label is stable on the antibodies for a long period of time. Um, we're, we're, we're comparing the injected antibodies that aren't labeled to ones that are, and the, and the label doesn't really seem to do much. And really what we're talking about here is, is an antibody like VRCO1, which I'll, I'll be going into it here in a second, is um, uh, we're labeling lysines, primary means. And so I think there's like 33 lysines there and, and, and you have control of the way you label. So we really want to get like less than two but more than one labels per antibody. We're, we, we shoot for about like 1.2, 1.3. So of those 30 lysines, just one of them are labeled and, and theoretically it's random as to which one gets labeled. So, so even if uh, uh, putting that floor at some position is bad, 
you still have 32 other spots that are okay. So, so I think that's part of the reason this isn't really a problem. Um, so, uh, so here is, now this is a piece of um, uh, ectocervix from a surgery at Northwestern. And, um, and here it's staining for IgG. And, and, and so um, it's kind of to, hard to see here, but there's IgG below here in the, in the tissue. And then we always see the IgG also in these surface layers. And, um, uh, and I always assumed it was coming from the lumen, but hopefully shortly I'll convince you that that's not how this works. And um, so if we injected antibodies uh, into, um, uh, this is, a lot of the work we did early on is with Gamunex C, and this is just pooled human IgG that's used for a variety of clinical purposes. Uh, we like it because it's 80 bucks a gram. So, so it's, a, it's, the, it's, a, it's a reasonable price compared to what a lot of um, antibodies would cost to get enough to inject into a monkey. This, this animal received IV injection of Gamunex uh, labeled with Psi-5, and four days later we did a necropsy. And so you can see accumulation of the, uh, the antibody within the smooth muscle here. You can see antibody appearing in the, in the mucosa here. And, um, and if, you, if we look, you can actually see places where it looks like the epithelium isn't working so well and the antibody is leaking out. And you can also see the antibody uh, accumulating in, in the mucus uh, sometimes. So, um, so, so this really gives us a chance to look at where the, where the antibodies end up. So doing these sorts of experiments, um, uh, the red is really kind of weird here, but anyway, uh, we'll be okay. Um, so, so this is that surface antibody, and, um, and this is just a piece of vaginal epithelium. Here is the lamina propria down here, and then this is the spinosum, the, the, the dividing part of the squamous epithelium of the vaginal vault. And these cells sort of start dividing here and then differentiate and basically flatten out and become uh, dead cells up here. So, um, so we have antibodies here, and we have antibodies below. And as I was staring at these images, um, it seemed like I could sometimes see some antibody in between here. So, um, so it, was, it was kind of fun. I, I did something that um, the, uh, I'm always telling the people in the lab not to do, and in fact, it actually upset them a lot more than, than I uh, expected. And you can start to see it here. You can see there's this signal in between. This, this isn't necessarily... Uh, uh, presenting perfectly, but you can see there was some signal here when you, when you jack it up, so this is all saturated, you could see some, some signals in between here, and, um, and I was actually traveling when I sort of sent these pictures back, and, and they were worried that I, you know, was crazy, so they went and did a bunch of control experiments and determined that this, this in-between space here was actually a, a, a real signal. So, um, so right about in that time window, um, I had bumped into John Muscola, at a meeting in Africa and, um, and, and, and talked about some of our results and, um, and suggested, you know, he sa said that, you know, we could get some VRCO1. He said you could have all you wanted. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, I asked Gary uh, Nabel for some a few years ago and he, and he referred me to the plasmids available at the, uh, at the, rep at the, at the NIH uh, 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 repository. And so I, you know, sort of, I just decided I had to go for it because you need a lot of these antibodies. So I asked uh, John for, I think 500 milligrams. And he's like, well, we don't want to thaw anything out to give it, so we're just going to give you a gram. Um, and, and he has been extremely uh, generous, and we're actually working uh, really closely with, um, uh, uh, with, with he, him and his team there. And so, um, so the first experiment, we took 50 milligrams per kilogram of, um, of VRCO1 and VRCO1LS. And if you remember, there was a, a nice paper last year in Nature uh, that showed that, that making this mutation that leads to tighter binding to FCRN um, uh, makes the antibody work better. It persists longer, it stays in the system longer. And so um, the idea was to compare these two and um, each one of these antibodies has their own characteristics. So we decided we'd start by mixing, uh, using two different labels, mixing these antibodies with the Gamunex that we had a lot of experience with. And we injected them into a macaque. Or we'll, so here's the, here's the um, the antibody, so this is the, um, the, 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 the VRC, or sorry, this is the Gamunex. Here's the two different VRCO1s. Here's the mix. We can put these on a, um, a fluorometer and we can nicely see the um, uh, differentiate between the two and it, we can be uh, fairly quantitative with this. And then working with Ron Vizi, we set up a pretty uh, extensive collection uh, protocol. So, so we took uh, plasma, um, uh, vaginal wex cells, and mucus 
uh, at, um, our, over our periods of the first day, um, 24, 48, and 72 hours. They wouldn't let us take more than three in a week, and then one week going out, actually out to 12 weeks. And then we also took vaginal and rectal biopsies at these, uh, these time points. And so this just shows you a little bit of the, the sera from these animals and, and some other experiments we have ongoing. And you can just, you can sort of see the, um, the different ratios of the floors and it's just kind of obvious to the naked eye. And then you take this plate and you put it into our fluorostar and, and it quantifies everything. And, um, and this is the sort of, of data we can uh, get. So we did all this blinded, we're unblinded now. So this is the VRCO1 versus the VRCO1 LS. And then here's the, the gaminex that was, that was in there with it. And when we uh, quantified all this, we very quickly um, reproduced um, the results that were in a nature paper. So, so this animal, the, the GH42, got the LS. The other animal got the VRCO1. And you can see that the, the antibody persisted uh, in the, at higher concentrations, had a, a, a longer half-life, com the LS, compared to the, um, the, the normal antibody. So now back to the experiment I mentioned earlier where we wanted to see how is the antibody getting into the squamous epithelium of the vaginal vault. Um, this is projecting, so this will be okay. So, so the white line shows the lumen in the tissue and the, and the problem here is these are like pinch biopsies and so it's not really a quality uh, tissue sample. But um, so I wanted to define the border between the, um, the, the, the spinosum here and, the, and this dead layer that's above it. And so um, I uh, electronically amplified this and drew in these green lines so we can all sort of agree with the border. And then, um, and then I boost the red up here a little bit. And what we can see, uh, I just love these kinds of, of, of results because it's sort of like a punch in the face. You just, you, you can't miss it. So for 24 hours post uh, uh, injection, we um, see the antibody accumulating in the sort of peripheral right at the edge here where these differentiate. So, so it's the, um, the granulosum would be a thin layer right above here below is the spinosum. We see the antibody accumulating in these cells and we just don't, this, no one's ever seen anything like this before, at least that we can we find trying to talk to people. But let's just worry about this, the second, second step here. So at 24 hours, you start to see a little bit of antibody beyond this border. The next day, there's, there's more antibody, 72 hours. It's, it's entering into the, 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 the a stratum corneum here more, and by one week, you achieve this steady state, and we now have the, uh, the antibody present throughout the tissue, as I showed you before in the, um, in the uh, staining for endogenous IgG. Um, the, the other thing that's really just amazing, and, and I just keep hoping somebody's going to, uh, after one of these talks, is going to jump up and say, I bet you it's this cell type, and we could figure it out and move on. But um, you can really, I'll, I'll show you some close-ups here from, from this specific one, but you see these, these, these cells that are, that are um, getting the antibody. So what we think is going on uh, is that a, a little bit of antibody gets through the basal layer into this spinosum. We can detect a little bit there, but it then concentrates at the other side in these, in these cells. They just, then as they differentiate, they deliver the antibody into the stratum corneum. And I think they're also delivering it to the vaginal vault. So this is how the large amounts of IgG in the vaginal vault get there. This is something that's referred to as transcytosis. And I'll show, I'm not transcytosis, um, oh man. Transudation, thank you, transudation. And um, I'll be doing some experiments, we'll be doing some experiments in here to, to try to address that. So, um, but let's, and I'll just focus a little bit on these cells. So I'm gonna zoom in from this same image. And you can, you can see, they're, they're, they have nuclei, they're, they're individual cells. You can see the, the ecoherin around them that are just concentrating lots of these antibodies, uh, injected antibodies. We get the same thing with the gamunex that was injected at the same time. Um, this is just to get rid of the, the green. Um, here is, you can really see the cells clearly here. Um, you know, they have nuclei and you can just see as the cells are differentiating, they're compacting and they're just becoming part of this layer up here. They appear to be delivering the, the antibody. So surely this must be some kind of artifact of the injected antibody or the floor or something. But we can go into uh, human and, and animal tissue and, um, and, uh, and stain for IgG and um, unfortunately this isn't, um, uh, projecting 
as well as I might like, but, but you can see, and this is now uh, monkey vaginal tissue, and you can see these cells present, and you can see them flattening out here as and the lumen would be, uh, would be over here. Um, and, uh, right, so, so, th so this seems to be what's going on, and it's just, it's just very, um, very mysterious. I'll just, um, uh, we're trying to look at differences between VRCO1 and VRCO1 LS, and, and this is ongoing. Um, we did complete a second experiment where we mixed the, since the, the antibody behaved very nicely, we then labeled VRCO1 LS and VRCO1, uh, mixed them together and in, injected them. And, um, and unfortunately, it's really hard to see, but we, see, we can see accumulation in some of these cells along the, the base, basal layer. And then this animal is in the luteal phase, so it shed that whole stratum corneum, but we can see uh, the antibody concentrating uh, here at the surface. Um, this is a, uh, an image from, the, um, from that Nature paper I mentioned, uh, Co et al. And um, uh, we're, surely FCRN has something to do with this. We, we're really struggling to get a, an antibody that works well for us. But in this paper, they, um, the, 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 and Ashley was part of this too, really focused on the mucosa here. And if you, um, we sort of see something very different. We see the antibody within the tissue, within the lamina propria, but it really isn't um, uh, concentrating very well at all uh, in, those, uh, in those epithelial cells. So, so we've talked to John and his team about this, and, and we're moving forward with some experiments to try to get at that. Oops. So um, because of this potential connection with the transudation, we decided to do a, a different kind of an experiment. So we got human serum albumin um, and labeled it. And because in transudates, um, there's a lot of serum albumins in transudates. So the idea is if this is something related to transudation, we might uh, see them going together. So we labeled, uh, uh, Sci-5 labeled human serum albumin, mixed it with Gaminex, injected it into the, the monkey, did the biopsies. And what we can see, uh, see here, I'll just go right to the next one is that the, the, basically the wave of antibody and serum albumin go together. And, um, and, and then, what, but what we see, and, and it's not very clear here, but then what we see is, this will be better. So, so as then, this is a week later, and so that the, the injected stuff is throughout, and then you see in these superficial layers, the antibody is concentrated there, as um, we've seen repeatedly, endogenously and with these injected uh, aspects, but the BSA seems to, or the human serum albumin seems to diffuse out of those superficial layers. So we think we're looking at um, transudation and, and we have some more experiments to do. Interestingly, uh, BSA or serum albumins also interact with FCRN. So, um, so there, there could be something interesting uh, there. And then um, the last uh, thing I want to touch upon is uh, the other antibody uh, uh, thing that we're really interested in, which is the interaction of, of antibodies with mucins. And, um, and we've had some really good progress, and um, it's, it's real. So it, it sort of goes, it's based on this, uh, this idea that um, you have uh, antibodies floating around. They bind to a pathogen, or something like HIV. You now get... Malt, and and, and the, the actual ability to antibody to bind to the mucin is very weak. But when you cover the pathogen with antibodies, you can get avidity, so you start to get tight binding. Um, and this is what you would find in the literature for the most part. And, and then, you know, this was the model that we started with. And so, actually, HIV has very few envelope proteins on its surface, so maybe the reason it does that is to sort of dodge this, this mechanism. And this could be going on, but we, we've, we don't really have um, evidence for it. Instead, what we find is that um, the antibodies bind very tightly to the mucins. And, um, and then the, 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 pre, the antibodies on the mucins can then act to trap uh, pathogens like, um, like HIV. And I think a lot of the experiments that argued against this, they, you would take a fluorescent antibody and put it into the mucus and it just float around. And I think that's because all the binding sites are occupied by the antibodies that are already present within the, within the compartment. So, and then, and then the good thing about this is you could um, potentially at least slow the movement of the pathogen through the mucus layer, whether it had a lot or fewer, um, fewer receptors. So, um, and the reason we're interested in mucus is that um, all, 
I think all the places, except for IV drug use, the places where HIV transmission takes place are coated with mucus. I can see Danny's enjoying the cervix picture. Um, get him a bucket. Um, so, um, so basically the, the, the mucus is made uh, within the endocervix uh, and, and then it, it, it is um, uh, released from the cervix and then is spread over the, the vaginal vault. And this uh, shows you just sort of what, what mucus is. It's just a mesh, meshwork of, of mucins. And so um, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the CABD, um, we, we got a big group to work on this and um, Galit Alter started to do some uh, ELISAs to, um, to, to, to look at possible things that interacted with antibodies. And so what she found um, uh, was that a, um, or what somebody in her lab found, uh, we don't actually get to do experiments anymore, any of us, but um, uh, was a fragment of MUC16 um, when you took antibodies from different um, uh, conditions, including HIV positive, HCV positive, acute flu, or healthy, there was more binding in, these, uh, in this ELISA that was detectable. This change only was seen after um, uh, uh, about a year and sort of in, in, in the chronic phase and then a bunch of controls that you know, um, were valid in different ways um, didn't, really, uh, didn't necessarily show this binding. And um, we had a sense that you know, one of the things that, that, that Gleet has found is that the, the patterns of glycans on the antibodies changes as, as uh, HIV infection and disease advances. And so you basically, on the antibody, you have these glycans there, and, 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 and these glycoforms get really very complicated, but they're sort of this pro-inflammatory, our, our A fucosylated no fucose, and A galactosylated no galactose, so it's a smaller glycan. Um, and then you have a complete glycan that even has sialic acids on the end, is sort of um, deemed anti-inflammatory. Um, frankly, this whole thing has really driven me crazy because it's not sort of like an avidin biotin binding. It's much more like, like lectins. So, so the binding can, the, the specificity of the mucin for the antibody, um, it'll, it'll bind to um, any number of these glycans, but if you give it two, it would prefer to bind to this one, but it's not 100% versus zero, it's like 60-40. So it, it really, um, really drove us crazy, um, and, um, but, but kind of in um, uh, taking a new way to, to look at this, going beyond the ELISAs, which are really pretty um, sloppy, to be honest with you, we, uh, uh, and sort of inspired by the review of our paper, we started to do uh, SPR. And along the way, we also discovered that um, at least for, so, so at first, this was a bit of a, a cluster, um, we, we treated the antibodies with PGNA stuff to cut off the glycan. And then we mixed them together and it didn't bind anymore. So we're like, wow, the glycan on the um, antibody is important. But it turned out the glycan on the antibody wasn't important. It was the glycan on the mucin that was important. And, and, and we didn't purify the PGNA F away from the antibody because it just didn't seem to be, uh, be important. So, um, so now using um, uh, SPR, uh, which is a very quantitative way to look at protein-protein interactions. It's this um, a plasmon resonance. Um, we, um, we now did these experiments here. So we're going to look at FC uh, gamma, um, which is a, a surface uh, protein that binds to antibodies that is um, on uh, cells that, that kill other cells. So you can have antibody-directed cell killing. Um, we compared it to the MUC16 binding and then protein A. And so we could either cut the glycan off uh, and this is using bulk uh, uh, antibody from infected individuals, or we could use a, um, a, a bacterially produced um, uh, uh, protein that cleaves off part of the glycan. So it actually, sorry, it cleaves, instead of cleaving here like PGNase-F does, it cleaves here and it leaves this little stump there. And so what this data shows is that um, that uh, the MUC16 prefers to bind to the smallest possible glycan. And the smallest possible glycan is actually something that doesn't really exist in nature. That's just to cut it off completely. So you go from detecting hardly any, any binding to cutting off the glycan and getting very robust binding. Um, and then you sort of, for FC gamma R3, you get this um, very, uh, get a decrease in KD because it needs the glycan to be there. And then 
the, removing the glycan or not really doesn't have a big influence on, um, on binding to protein, uh, protein A. So, um, so we were looking at, at we, as we were doing all this, we looked at a bunch of monoclonals and we found some that bound uh, uh, well to the MUC16 and others that bound poorly. And so we have these antibodies now, because that was a big population, it's sort of hard to know what in there is binding. Here we have two specific antibodies, although they have variation in their glycoforms. And we, we can do it, we can more or less get the same result. So if you remember, I told you, uh, well, right, so we can, so VRCO1 bound fairly well, but if we cut off the glycans and make it all the same, it binds better, right? The binding to FC gamma R3 goes down, the KD goes down, and again, the, 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 the difference in protein A isn't very great. And then rituximab, which didn't bind very well at all, um, we can make it bind, uh, associate much better when we cut off the, uh, cut off the glycan. So, so this was sort of nice because we were also struggling with isolating uh, FABs versus FCs. We know, um, for instance, the, uh, um, uh, so we're cutting off the, um, the glycan that's on the uh, constant portion of the antibody here and we're getting a big increase in binding. So this sort of shows that that's important. It shows the glycan plays a role. It was just kind of this nice experiment that really solidified um, that story and we're about to, about to resubmit it. So um, uh, one of the things we, we, we wanted to do was to try to translate this into macaques. So if you remember the data where chronic, uh, individual chronic HIV, it bound, it bound better. Um, we did the same thing with macaques and could show that um, when we took the same animals and, in, and at, before and after infection, some, um, some uh, sera that were uh, banked, we could see an increase in binding. We could see better binding in, in chronically in, in infected macaques. So now we wanted to, um, to study these antibodies in more detail. So we could take basically um, uh, metal containing beads that you can purify with a magnet, coat it with MUX16, uh, get the antibodies on there, and then we wanted to loot them off to study them. And, um, and this really drove home the idea to us that the binding was tight because we couldn't dilute with low pH, we couldn't dilute with high pH. We had to use six molar guanidine hydrochloride, which denatures things pretty uh, completely to get the antibody off. And then the, the bummer was you're also denaturing the antibody itself. So, so that's why these experiments include a control where we, um, where we denature and renature the starting material um, to, uh, to, to look, to, to compare if that, if that step is, is messing up the experiment. And then we worked with Georgia Tamaris, who really has great expertise in doing these um, mapping of the different specificities. And what we found was something um, pretty interesting. So if you, um, if you the, the antibodies you MUX16 purify, um, uh, they, if you look at GP120 binding in the, in the macaque, you really don't see an enrichment of the, uh, the ability of the antibody to bind when you uh, normalized by total IgG. But when you look at other um, antigens such as GP41, we see this big boost in binding. So, so there's a selectivity, the immune response can selectively direct antibodies to interact with this, with this MUX16. And just here's some more examples. So for 120, we don't see much of an enrichment, but for anything that has uh, 41 components in it, we see the difference. We've done the peptide mapping that, that, that she can do, et cetera. And we also see this effect um, with um, non-surface antibodies, but P55 and, and, and um, uh, uh, derivatives of that. So, um, so now what about a fun in a functional assay, what, what happens? So um, uh, we worked together with um, uh, George um, Lewis at, uh, at uh, Maryland. And, and, and did a ADCC assay. And so we started by looking at interactions with the uh, FC gamma R uh, receptors. And so this is the MUX, the purple and the, and the green are um, examples of, of, or this is the MUX16 eluded ones. The red one is the uh, denatured and refolded pooled, you know, that we started with. And, um, and what we can see here is that the binding is much less when we, we pull out the MUX16 binders. And then I think this is sort of a, a, a fun result. So then, and then we can plug it into the ADCC assay. So here the controls are 2G12 and um, uh, F240 versus a, uh, a non-specific antibody. And what we can see is that this is now uh, ADCC to HIV. We can see that there is um, good um, uh, killing 
uh, starting with the zero we, we had at the beginning, if we fold, unfold and refold it, um, but the MUC16 bound portion does not um, uh, deliver in the ADCC assay. And the same thing is true in the, for the macaques. Now the human antibodies uh, aren't going to work anymore, so, so they're all down here. Um, the, uh, the monkey antibodies show the, the same thing, and we now have this reproduced for quite a few uh, different, um, um, from a f quite a few different animals. So, so we, we think that this mucin binding is representing a, uh, a new effector function for the immune system because it's, uh, it's influence regulated by glycoform and, and a chronically infected individual makes more antibodies that like to bind to it than, than not. Um, there's an antigen specificity uh, to it and it's sort of fascinating because um, GP120 and GP41 are, are linked to, and together. Um, granted, the 120 gets shed, but we see this tenfold enrichment of, of antibodies that are to 41 going to the mucin, and then they, it's distinct from ADCC. It has sort of its own, um, own specificity. And then um, I'll just finish with one last piece of data, which is um, the thing about MUC16 that makes it less interesting is that um, it's a cell-associated mucin. It, it, it does paint the, the mucosal surfaces of columnar epithelia, but um, it's, it's not really shed very, or, and it gets shed, but when you think of mucus, it's the secreted mucins, MUC5B, MUC5AC, and, um, and we finally sort of um, came up with a way to produce this in bulk and then produce it under conditions where it wasn't already going to bind to antibodies. And then um, we started to do these sorts of experiments, which uh, are pretty cool. So we can take a standard TZMBL assay, uh, and this is with VRCO1, and we add this MUC5AC to it, and we get a big uh, increase in its potency to neutralize in that assay. Um, we see uh, an even bigger effect with VRCO3, which is less potent at the beginning, but you get a big shift. And then to try to get an idea of the mechanism, and, and we're working on this hard, we, we either um, keep the amount of MUC5AC constant and then change the amount of antibodies, or in this case, we just mix them together at more or less a one-to-one -one ratio. And you can see that, um, that you can, can e at least with this VRCO3, we can get an even bigger, bigger boost. Of course, you got to show the controls. So here is just increasing amounts of MUC5AC by itself. It doesn't inhibit by itself. And then here, are, um, here is rituximab, uh, which isn't inhibiting. It doesn't bind to the virus. So, um, so there's um, some specificities there that we're teasing apart. And, um, and this just shows some uh, examples of that. So here is the... Um, Right, so the, when you do the pre-mixing, we can get, increase the potency in that assay by th almost 350-fold for VRCO3. So these are potentially having a big effect, and, it's, and it's kind of, I think it's nice because people can identify with this assay, and we can, we can throw in a mucin in there, and it can, it can make it work a little bit better. So maybe, you know, in, in, in vivo, where the mucins will be present, uh, this could have, have an impact. So I'll go ahead and uh, stop there. And, and really, um, uh, the, the new interactions with uh, John Mascola and the VRC uh, people on the, on the antibodies there are, are great. We're, we're about to do a, um, the biopsies are really give limited information. So I, I have a, um, 10 macaques that just got infected in another study. So we're going to use them to do whole animal necropsies at those same time points. So we'll really be able to get an idea of the PKPD of the antibody distribution in the animal. Um, and, and those are about to get started. Uh, Patrick was the one that um, uh, pushed to throw the mucin into the TZMBL assay. Uh, that, that, that was really nice. And then um, uh, uh, other collaborators. So I'll go ahead and stop there and answer any questions.